Hello, this is uh, Kevin Foley, and this is another uh, chapter in our Who's Phillipstown series. And today I'm with Manette Gunther, who has a lot of reflections on the history of Phillipstown to offer us. Welcome, Manette. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> so I wanted to ask you first, uh, as someone who's been steeped in the history of Phillipstown, what has that meant to you as you have lived here? What, what has examining all of the history and all of the what's gone on before meant to your life? Well, it meant that I could pass it on to the children that were here. And unfortunately, they're not doing that now because the curriculum has changed. But when I was teaching, they, you know, gave us kind of free reign. And I could instill in them, hey, I have all this history behind me. And most of the kids that went through with me could tell you about they could name all of the generals in the in the Revolutionary War. And in fact, we used to go down to the Mandeville House and see where uh, Washington and, uh, uh, what's his name, Green and Hamilton and Putnam had all sat around the table. The table is still there. And it's wonderful that you walk in there. And one of the things, we had a music teacher, Helen Jimenez, she came once a week. They had a little spinet that they pushed from room to room so she could have her lessons. And when it came a certain time of the year, she would come in and tell them, now this is the time that so-and-so did so-and-so because her, I don't know, great grand, one of the great-grandmothers was a serving girl down at the, at the Mandeville house during the revolution. And during the Revolution, that was the only civilized house for a gentleman to stay. So all the generals had to come over and stay at the Mandeville house, and they had the great dining room. Well, uh, the girls that worked there all knew the generals were there, and they went upstairs, and their room was above the dining room. And Mrs. Semenis would tell how her grandmother would explain how, because the boards didn't fit very well. Even in our day, the boards were a little wide. You could look down. And she said uh, they The floorboards, yeah, the okay. Floor look down, <laughs> look down through the cracks and see these generals. And here was somebody that lived in our town, and she got it from her great, I don't know which grandmother it was, and the kids just loved it. Somebody who had a tie with with the past could tell them about seeing General Washington down there in the Mandeville house eating at the table. And when somebody tells you that, it kind of gets interesting. And what do you think that um, all of uh, knowing that history and sharing it with the students uh, means for the life of the community? I don't know, but I hope it, it makes them feel that uh, a pride in a heritage because so many places in America don't have the heritage anymore. So we're kind of fortunate to be connected uh, to the early history of the founding of the Republic and those kinds of things. I remember <clears throat> I used to follow Hamilton uh, Fish and he used to go around and give speeches and put on his little Veterans of Foreign War cap. I think he lived to be 105, didn't he? And, and he'd always have a speech somewhere. Wherever he was going to give a talk, I would go, just because it was the same talk and I knew what it was. But I just felt somebody should go and listen. But I remember one time I was talking to him, and he said, uh, I was talking about history, and he said, I sat on the lap of a gentleman who shook the hand of George Washington. Now you stop and think about that, because the man lived to be 105, but he was a wee little boy, but he said he remembered that all his life. And I've always remembered that. Hey, I knew somebody who knew somebody. Right. <laughs> but you feel a connection to it. I feel a connection, yeah. So would you say that the, the historical tradition of Phillipstown is what you appreciate most about Phillipstown? I think so, yeah, I think so. Because when, when I moved in, uh, the old estates were uh, crumbling and 
the younger generations had moved out and they, they were, the houses were in such bad shape that they couldn't keep them up. So they were selling them to all the young GIs who were coming back from World War II. And that's how we all came back in here. We all took these old houses. And of course, with youth and energy, we, we all got in there and we did the work ourselves. We scrubbed the boards and we took the paint off the, 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 the woodwork and everything like that. It took us years to do it, but we were all in the same boat and that's what we did. We, we moved in and then we took these old houses and built them up again. Now, over the time since you first settled uh, in uh, Garrison, uh, you have seen a lot of changes in society in general, of course, but um, what about the, the, the changes that you've seen uh, here in Phillipstown and what both uh, from a, a positive perspective and perhaps from a negative perspective? Well, for a long time, if you lived in Garrison, you didn't come to Cold Spring much. Uh, Got to remember, there were no supermarkets around. We had to, I had to go down to Peekskill to do my marketing, huh. rather than come here because I had rather a sad introduction to Cold Spring. My husband uh, had business here. He was a special agent, and uh, for the insurance company, and he went around to all these insurance agents and they conned him into saying he had to join the Lions Club. And he thought, well, he joined the Lions Club because that was good for business. And the Lions Club were always having a ladies' night. And we said, you gotta come to ladies' night, which was held down at Gus's. And uh, I was a moon-faced, you know, 20-year-old came. And <laughs> the, you'd go into Gus's and the men would stop at the bar and then the ladies went into the dining room. Now, Gus's was? antique bar the hotel okay the and where was the hotel right where it is where which 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 are we speaking of hudson oh the hudson house hudson okay. house yeah that was gus's bar. everybody knew it as gus's and his father ran it before he did and the moogs ran it before them and it was gosh i don't know I'm just trying to think when, I think it's 1835. It's, it was the oldest hotel in continual operation in the United States, right. except for the Beekman House Be at one say. time. And then of course, uh, when the new owner came in, um, they raised the whole thing and lifted it up because it was always getting flooded. Right. Yeah. So you would be at Gus's at the Lions Club. Oh yeah, but what what it was is uh, the tables were all spread out like this, and the ladies were sitting down, and so I walked over and I saw and I said, "Is this chair taken?" And the woman said, "No, no." And I said, "Is it all right? right?" "Yes, it is." And so I was always taught, you know, stick my hand out. I'm Annette Gunther, and uh, she introduced herself and she said, "Where are you from?" And I said. Well, I live in Dr. Chorley's. I learned to say Dr. Chorley's house. He'd been living there for so long. Then that put a place where I lived, see, um, down in Garrison. And she went, hmm. The only thing the people in Cold Spring dislike worse than the people in Nelsonville are the people from Garrison. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Cold <laughs> I told my husband, I will not set foot in Cold Spring again. And I didn't for a long, long time. And what got you to uh, eventually work your way back? Uh, Things must have changed over time. It, it did. My husband died and we had to sell the house. I couldn't keep up 40 acres in an 11-room house. So I moved into the North Highlands. And then um, later on, uh, they were building the condominiums down here. So I decided that this was it because my, my children had grown up and moved away, so it was just me and, and two mothers. But by then, attitudes had changed about people from Garrison. Not so much. Not if, if those older people were still around. Ah, the younger okay. people, yes. Okay. And then I guess I got into the historical society and uh, living here. But everybody thought, always thought I was Garrison. For years, people thought, oh, she's from Garrison. Still, even though at one time you were. 
Perhaps it was because you spoke of the history so much. Maybe, but because they remembered that's where I came from. When you look at Phillipstown today, uh, what's your assessment of it? I don't think the new people know even what Phillipstown was. I don't think they even know it's named after the Phillips family. So you think that there should be more of an effort to... Well, this, I don't think the young people are as much interested in um, history as they used to be. Mm. Or what can I say? Heritage, I guess, is what I want to say. That they come in, they, they couldn't care less. They know they're going to ride the train. But then all the men did. There was nothing nothing around here for us. We were, they were all, you know, uh, college educated. They were down in New York. So they all got up, took the six o'clock train into New York and back again. All right. If there's one thing that you could change about Phillipstown, uh, what would it be with a wave of your hand? I'm just trying to think. A lot of things do annoy me. I don't go on the dirt roads anymore, but... Um, do you like the dirt roads, or you don't yeah, like I the like dirt? Yeah, I like the dirt roads. Right, of course. I what I wish so. we could do is uh, do something about 9D to get the speed limit down. Because okay. that is that is so dangerous. It used to be the kids could walk to school. They could yeah. ride their bikes to school. They A long 9D, you mean? Oh, I, it's hard to imagine that. <laughs> no, they could. It's hard to imagine that now, people doing it. I There were a group of kids that would uh, live up on the old Albany Post Road, ride their bicycles down. They'd all meet at the four corners or right there at the, pl at the uh, common. Then they'd all ride down to Mom's, had sort of a diner down in Manitou, and she would have coffee and pie for the kids. That was their breakfast. They'd go down there. Then they'd turn around, she'd get them off, they'd come back and come to school, see? And then they'd all, can you picture doing that now? It's hard to. And the kindergartners would walk to school. We thought nothing of it. All right, now people are much more safety conscious and a lot of from a lot of different directions. I had a very brilliant idea of how to stop them, especially the trucks that come over there, the big ones. And they do it because the, there would be a backup on 84, and this would be a shortcut to come up. And I said, well, what you do, ladies, is just before the bridge is a pullout, and I said, you station one of, one of your group in there watching the bridge. When a truck comes across the bridge, that lady swings out and gets in front of that truck and goes 40 miles an hour, which will drive them up the wall, see? Because <laughs> you can't pass from the Bear Mountain Bridge to Cold Spring because it's double line. And so I said, that's what you do. I said, when that gets around through their CBs, they, they won't come here anymore. But the ladies didn't want to do that. Right, right. And so um, before we finish, what keeps you busy today in Phillipstown? Well, I work several days a week at Boscobel giving the tours. And then uh, after that, I go into the Historical Society when I have time to help with the volunteer work there. And then in the afternoons I go swimming and uh, a few other things around. So I have usually so much to do. Yeah, so the community is still very important to you and what it has to offer. Oh yes, oh yes. Okay. Very much so. All right, well thank you very much. Now I brought you something. Okay. Uh, this was given to me and I don't think the Historical Society particularly wants it to go out. I said, I think it should be published in the newspaper. Um, because the original one was kind of hard to read. Once you get down here, you're okay. It seems that somebody back 1950-something... 53. ...wanted... And they called it Cold Spring on Hudson. Yes, indeed. <laughs> they wanted the to have a library for the county, all right? Wanted to have a county something or other. And then this woman 
wrote the answer to why we couldn't have a county library. Okay. But it's kind of interesting because she talks about the um, the Indians in in the big forest. That was a big deterrent. That that uh, big woods. But I think uh, if people understood, this is the way it was when I moved in. All right. Okay. Right. This is right around the time when you moved in. Yeah. Yep. Okay. See, but I did not know that then. That this was given to me, and so I thought I would keep this, and then. We had this would be an interesting thing to run just as a historical uh, uh, piece. But they didn't want to do it because they thought it was sort of a slap in the face to the Cold Spring people. See? Yeah, that's okay. And then here it was, a garrison person doing it, but this really was written by a Cold Spring person who was very proud of it. But if you read it, it kind of, uh, people kind of laugh at it, but it was very serious at the time. Mm -hmm. And then we had a gal named Peggy Pearson. She used to have a, a shop across the street on the corner of uh, Fair Street and salt to the earth. Whatever this woman touched, she could make into a masterpiece. She uh, did oil paintings, uh, got tired of that. So then she went into black and white or tan. And she went into all phases. Then she decided to be a sculptor. <laughs> And her kitchen was dust all over, dust all over. She was a very bad housekeeper. Uh, what She would make the clothes that were sold in, in the shop across the street. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ideas. Whatever she touched, she could write poetry, and she did. And uh, I guess she got a little bit provoked at Garrison one day, so she wrote a poem about the people moving in, and uh, then she moved to Florida, and she would conduct the poetry sessions of the Barnes and Noble when she got down into Florida. They meet every Sunday, and she was the one that uh, kind of paved the way for the the gays that move in, moved in because they were very artistic and so was she. Uh, and this it says April 2000. She wrote it in 2000? No, that's when she sent it to me. Ah, okay. She was in Florida and she said, well, she had this, because we corresponded for a long time and sure. she sent this, so I put the date on there because, no, she does. That looks interesting, huh? What, I'm trying to think, when did she die? I think only one of her children is around here now. I've forgotten which one it is. The one, the one, the youngest one had Lou Gehrig's disease and his family moved him out to Colorado where there is a support group. But uh, yeah, she was a very, very interesting person. Oddball, but very interesting. Okay. So we had a lot of interesting, and of course, don't forget Ben Fraser. He was one of the most interesting people here. He's the one that saved Boscobel. He saved the chapel. Uh, he moved a lot of the houses around. He had just jacked them up, moved them in the wintertime. That's the way they did it. Of course, he'd do it at 6 o'clock in the morning on the back roads, and the husband would be going to the, trying to catch the train, and they hated him. But he was a dear, sweet person. 